So it's my great pleasure to invite you uh, to uh, join us for our uh, presentation on new towns. Uh, this is part of a uh, two and a half day program where we've invited uh, some of the world's leading experts who are scholars on the development of new towns and the practitioners who've actually uh, led the development of the new towns. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, uh, several of them tonight, and uh, many of the rest of them are sitting in the front uh, first two rows. And uh, let me introduce my uh, partner in crime, uh, uh, Anne Forsyth. The uh, two of us are heading up a program uh, that's been sponsored by Ivanki uh, China, and we're very grateful to them for their support. Anne. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, I'm Anne Forsyth, Professor of Urban Planning at Harvard GSD, and as Rick said, um, co-organizer of a two-day workshop and also helping him moderate this session tonight. The session tonight is actually going to be in three main parts. First of all, we're going to have a set of panelists with experiencing design, experience designing and evaluating new towns present some case studies and thoughts. Um, and as we uh, transition from one to the other of these um, workshop, participants will ask a brief questions. So we'll have a presentation, a few questions, presentation, a few questions. The panelists are Stephen Kellenberg, a senior vice president at the Irvine Company in the Newport Breach office. He heads the community uh, planning group in the company's urban planning and design department. And earlier he worked at EDAO and AECOM. Paul Buckhurst is a principal at BFJ Planning and its affiliates, Perkins Eastman Architects, and he has a very extensive portfolio of international work spanning four decades and including new city communities in Canada, Brazil, Egypt, China, Vietnam, the UK, US, and Saudi Arabia. Next will be uh, James von Klemperer, who's president and design principal at Cone Peterson Fox. He's responsible for leading a staff of 550 people in six offices around the world, as well as working on projects at a variety of scales, including the uh, new town. Pascaline Gabert works for the Global Relations Forum and was until recently the director of the EU's European New Towns and Pilot City Platform. That work has involved collaborations with new towns around the world. And she's author or editor of a number of books, including the book European New Towns. As a second part of the um, present of this session, uh, Alex Garvin uh, will then respond. Alex is currently the president and CEO of AGA Public Realm Strategies, and he's held prominent positions in five New York City administrations, including Deputy Commissioner of Housing and a City Planning Commissioner. And he has just published the book, What Makes a Great City. And after that, we'll open up to a broader set of questions. Now I'm going to hold, hand over the stage to Steve Kellenberg. Let's see. Oh, you go forward. Where, where do I? Green. Uh, thanks, Ann. Um, our assignment was to be thinking, uh, you know, look retrospectively a little bit at the history of new towns in the 20th century and think forward about those in the 21st century. And my particular focus was on site planning and, and design. And uh, I started by really sort of looking over the uh, very rich history of new towns. You know, we've, we've really been designing new towns and thinking about them for about 3,000 years, if not a little bit longer, all the way back to sort of biblical times. And when we look at them, we can, we can kind of start to see that there are certain uh, immutable uh, components that um, they have in common. And, and we've kind of simplified it down to these four. And this does seem a little bit simplistic, but at least it creates a little bit of a, uh, I guess, frame of reference for moving them forward and talking about how uh, these particular components of cores, connectivity, green infrastructure, and public realm might uh, transform as we move forward uh, in time. So uh, a few comments on cores and centers first. Uh, the, you know, historically towns obviously had cores and centers, and they 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 they've met filled a very uh, important purpose uh, in you know obviously including uh, 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 
jobs and services within uh, uh, a close proximity to housing. And as we move forward, especially in the, with the advent of climate change, the importance of uh, uh, cores that you know, in, reduce uh, uh, VMT, that increase local trip capture, provide the opportunity for uh, walking districts, uh, and let alone reduce the personal time required for daily needs and the ability for course to support transit uh, need to be um, uh, importantly considered as we move forward. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is thinking about the, what really constitutes a core. Uh, and uh, one of the approaches is uh, this a concept called the golden mean. And the golden mean is the idea that if we sort of, if we take a half mile uh, or one kilometer radius from a core and we uh, simply uh, uh, duplicate the mix of, of jobs, housing, and services that you find in a larger regional area that has, has achieved a stabilization, in other words, a self-sufficient uh, point of uh, functionality, that uh, we should be able to achieve an optimal uh, level of internal trip capture and reduced VMT. The, di the table on the bottom shows where three uh, sort of good, better, best scenarios were developed for a district in Singapore. Uh, the middle one was chosen because it was the combination of uses that was closest to the golden mean but still aligned best with uh, market uh, conditions. The other thing that we've been doing is uh, taking uh, using G GIS spatial analysis analytics and, and searching for the right combination of the location of jobs, services, and housing that achieve the highest level of accessibility. Uh, and you can see that, and, and we look at it a variety of different ways, home to job, home to retail, home and job to medical and so forth, and actually create various scores of accessibility. And by doing this, it, it, it helps inform a decision on what, which of a, of a planning, multiple planning scenarios would allow us to get, achieve the highest level of accessibility. And we can actually do a little calibration and start to uh, determine a, a carbon footprint uh, for a district or for a master plan. And so as we sort of uh, dis, you know, pick which alternative uh, is the best, we have a new data point now where we can be looking at carbon footprint at a very early stage in the planning and design uh, process. Uh, connectivity, uh, second uh, uh, consistent factor in sort of looking at new towns over, over time. And the idea of sort of uh, activity uh, corridors or the use of linearity in the, as a backbone urban design framework element that connects the cores previously talked about in a way that it, uh, uh, in, again, encourages uh, multimodal uh, connectivity. And even if early ages, new towns can't really support uh, ambitious levels of, of transit. It creates a urban form that as uh, time evolves and as the density starts to infill into the community, that uh, uh, transit can occur earlier and at a, uh, at a, at a lower cost. Uh, again, uh, in, even especially in suburban locations where transit might take longer to occur, we can use, uh, again, this GIS uh, spatial analysis to uh, identify different forms that would allow transit to come in earlier. In this case, we had a, this, this is a, uh, some, some diagrams from a community in Northern California uh, where we started with, uh, there's a heavy rail transit stop and there was, um, uh, a fairly low level of transit proximity, but by developing a sort of linear corridor of hubs and shuttle stops, we could dramatically increase the amount of, uh, of transit access. Uh, uh, additional ideas is since if we're starting with a, with a blank canvas on a new town, why not rethink the opportunity of uh, creating more efficient uh, transit modalities, especially at a local scale? Uh, recognizing, re, you know, sort of national scale, regional scale, and then local scale, could we in fact uh, develop um, tighter, more called capillary systems of local transit that would be based more on uh, NEVs or electrical vehicles and allow a, a recapture of land area uh, uh, from the uh, dedication to aut automobile and, and parking. This is a diagram for a district in Singapore that we were, uh, we were looking at. And then there's a lot of discussion recently on autonomous vehicles. Um, we could probably spend a whole uh, seminar just on that topic, but we're starting to think about parking recapture, higher efficiency roadway design, uh, uh, redensification of areas due to recapture of 
of parking, but also potentially the resuburbanization resurb forces once uh, if commuter time actually turns into productive time in cars, does that uh, incentivize uh, actually lower density regional patterns? So we're a little concerned about that. Third uh, co component, green infrastructure, uh, it's, it's the idea of actually reintroducing both ecological uh, valued lands and and uh, public open space into the fabric of the town in a way that maximizes edge condition and gets and achieves the highest level of, of accessibility to the local population. Uh, this being a diagram for, uh, again, in Singapore for Marina Bay, uh, where we've uh, create a, a central uh, ecological corridor and actually um, adjacent to the corridor uh, have uh, intensified the amount of uh, internal green uh, uh, space within the building fabric itself. Uh, there's a number of reasons we think it's important to uh, integrate this green infrastructure, a number of, uh, of, of human-based reasons, as well as a number of ecological uh, reasons as well. Uh, the, there's uh, a number of metrics in developing green infrastructure within the urban fabric. Uh, you know, the concept of hubs and links, uh, the uh, habitat diversity, biodiversity, edge condition metrics, and so forth, which, which make it a very interesting uh, design problem. This is uh, the, the master plan community that uh, I'm c c uh, currently uh, head of planning for, Irvine, out in uh, uh, Southern California. You can see the green infrastructure system that's in, inherent in that plan. And this is just recently completed piece of a green corridor that's linking uh, internal uh, neighborhoods and villages to external major natural open space. Lastly, the civic and public realm. Um, you know, the, the key piece here is to uh, have a, a, an intentional, strong urban design structure with uh, opportunities for placemaking uh, embedded within that structure. We call it strong bones, with one of the biggest concepts here being that as a, a long-term, larger-scale project goes through economic cycles, and land uses will inevitably change based uh, compared to uh, original planning concepts. These, uh, these good bones in this urban di design structure maintains the integrity of the plan. Uh, Tongzhou, this is a uh, district uh, we designed that again shows a central open space con uh, concept uh, with some you know, iconic buildings really creating an intentional urban design structure. And at a lower density, a suburban new town in uh, Arizona, again with a district core, you know, uh, civic boulevards, a series of uh, public formative parks and landscape interventions that create that, that, uh, that structure. And then of course the spaces that fit into that system need to um, be very thoughtfully designed. I think we've, we've probably, especially in the last 30 or 40 years, not given enough attention to the character of, uh, of public space. Uh, and as we have uh, shifts and generational shifts in the population and shifts in preferences, uh, these spaces need to be designed so there's lots of flexibility to adapt to those uh, generational and demographic values. Uh, all of this in, in, in our minds leads to, you know, hopefully, uh, moving those four components forward in time into the 21st century and, and using uh, sort of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs as a little bit of a guidepost for trying to allow new communities to reach a self-actualized mode where people can uh, really achieve their highest aspirations for uh, individual human development. Thank you. Yawning. Um, staying, oh, sorry, it's not a lot. Anyway, that's a great um, presentation you've given. What's special about new towns in terms of the urban design um, sort of features and character that you're talking about? Well, I think there's two or three things. One is that new towns have something that's very elusive and very valuable and, and sort of great, I guess, urban structure, and that is scale. You know, when you have a large piece of land, you, you can do things at, at, with scale that you can't do with smaller incremental developments. You can do things with amenities. You can do things with parks and open spaces. There's just more capital that can be invested in creating a sort of a higher quality, more layered and nuanced uh, set of urban places and spaces. The other thing, and this seems a little uh, contr contrarian, but uh, our, our practice has shown, it's, and that is, 
actual ecological uh, values, that the, the larger sites, especially, and this sounds really contradictory, located close to or around sensitive environmental areas, you can actually use the development of the projects to actually preserve and enhance uh, threatened ecological areas that, that incremental development uh, has, a very hard, uh, has a very hard time doing. The other thing, with, with larger new town development, you have the ability to uh, have a higher probability of achieve, achieving job housing balance and sort of these, this golden mean of land use balance where you have the least uh, uh, mobile emissions impact, greenhouse gas impacts, and the uh, uh, shortest uh, you know, driving times and, and reduced VMT vehicle miles traveled. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Buckhurst, who I have known for my entire career and who, among other things, started uh, his career uh, planning Milton Keynes in England. The Newtown examples I've selected represent, in a way, a kind of overview of uh, contrasting issues and opportunities. They involve very different time frames. They represent very different environments. And they certainly represent very different scales. I'll begin with Milton Keynes, which was really the, my first serious experience in Newtown planning. Milton Keynes was the largest of the Newtown plans developed after the war. It was designated with a 90 square kilometer site, much larger than earlier English new towns. It was also different in that it contained a number of existing residents, 40,000 people. So Milton Keynes actually started with its own phase one development, a bit of an advantage. Key features of the plan really evolve around this idea of producing a flexible open plan, very much in contrast to the concentric plans of earlier English new towns. A one grid, a, a one kilometer grid of roads defined approximately 100 neighborhoods. There was very much a focus on low rise development. In fact, our report stated that no building should be taller than the mature trees on site. This focus on green space was also echoed by setting aside about 38% of the land as green, recreation and open space. A goal that was reinforced by the corporation that has now developed about 180 miles of separate bikeways and pathways separate from the road system. And in fact, they boast of the fact that they've planted 22 million trees since 1972 in order to help establish this green environment. This just shows you the open character and quality of the existing city center. The current population is now approximating 240,000 people close to the perceived total in the report but recent government proposals now intend to expand the site by 20 square kilometers. This will probably involve a further population increase, adding up to about 375,000 people. Government proposals also are recommending higher density housing in order to promote more efficient transit use and to encourage private developer interest. In moving to Hanoi, we've got, a, again, a very different scale. In 2005, the Vietnamese government announced a, a threefold increase in the size of the capital city of Hanoi in order to accommodate, in the long-term future, expanded population. The master plan, therefore, looked at a study involving 3,000 square kilometers. And in the government brief, we were asked to look at ways to reduce outward expansion from the core city of Hanoi and to develop some satellite new cities. The master plan is focused, in fact, on preservation 
of existing agricultural land shown in green here, which forms a major green belt, which in turn will curb outward expansion from Hanoi and separate the core city from five new satellite cities. These vary in size from 200,000 to 5,000 people. And they will be self-contained as far as possible with a specialized focus on function and character. The 3,000 acres of land, 70% is designated as conservation land, not only to preserve important rice production, but also about 800 small craft villages that will remain in this area. Obviously, an important part of this plan concerns adequate road and transit connections linking the core city to these five satellite new towns. And that, in conjunction with the preservation of open space, are key issues in the long-term implementation. Fortunately, the Prime Minister designated the plan as part of law, and given this is Vietnam, I think we will be uh, ensured that most of the fundamental principles of this master plan will remain. Jumping to a different scale. This is um, a study in Jinan, Shandong province in China, which was proposed as a small new community in the year 2002. The five kilometer site lies to the south of the city of Jinan, which then had an existing population of about three and a half million residents. The undeveloped site was characterized by steep topography, particularly a series of hills to the south of the property. And it was the, the environmental constraints that formed a major um, framework for the master plan shown here, where the hills were preserved as major open space parks for the local community. The plan involved a development of fairly high density mixed use to the north and two lower density residential villages to the south located between the hills. Preservation of the natural features obviously included the Hilaris, but also a linear green park, which really kind of acts as a, a zipper between the high density development and low rise housing. The town has been built out within a 10 year period, meaning that an average of about 4,000 housing units were constructed every year, more than twice that achieved in Milton Keynes, for example. A battle over preserving the two hills led to a compromise where much higher density housing was eventually developed in the two residential areas. Over 50% of housing units are now within high rise towers of between 25 and 30 stories. And the average density is approximately 20,000 per square kilometer. This shows you uh, the mix of, of high-rise towers, some mid-rise, and a portion of that linear park. Taif in Saudi Arabia is an ongoing study and is part of the um, proposed development of high-tech new cities, partly in response to the threat of, of, of lower oil revenues. The plan involves a designated site of about 110 square kilometers. I was going to call it a green field site, but it's more like brown sand, I guess. It's sited next to a proposed new airport and an existing and historic souk, shown here in blue. An existing city of Taif is located about 35 miles kilometer to the south. It will be linked to this new development by high-speed transit. A target population of about 350,000 people was proposed in the design brief. The plan really is focused on a series of what we call multi-centers, a development of about 50 neighborhood cells, each containing between 4,000 and 6,000 residents, 
with each cell providing a local mosque, school, and recreation facilities. These cells then are turned, uh, clustered to form a series of larger neighborhood centers, and then those centers are overlaid by five much larger employment centers shown in the bottom left of this slide. Proposed housing focuses on low-rise, high-density development. With a probable density of about 7,500 residents per square kilometer. Two existing wadi provide key opportunities for desperately needed green landscape between this new city. In summary, I think these four examples are probably much too diverse for me to be able to draw any generalized common design features or characteristics. But in terms of lessons learned, I think I've I could say two or three things. First, recognition that new town plans inevitably change and will need to adapt given the unpredictability of future market and political conditions. Milton Keynes being an example, for example. One could just try and give the plan a good start. In terms of design, I think there are two common features that I've tried to emphasize in this very brief presentation. The first, preserving as much as possible existing natural landscapes and complementing that with a new green framework. And secondly, using mixed, mixing land uses, increasing density, encouraging walkability, providing for transit operations, all contribute to the goal of reducing dependence on the private car. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I was going to be let off. Um, you gave us uh, four compelling case studies. The first was Milton Keynes, that it took a long time to develop and had 40,000 existing residents. So surely had a very vibrant planning process, I imagine. And the last three were places with much more centralised government where planning is perhaps um, more able to be done by fiat. Is that the future, or um, yes, is that the future? Uh, it may be the future, perhaps, for developing countries, and it certainly, I, I think, is, is true in Vietnam. Vietnam is, in my view, is probably a kind of 20 years behind China in terms of its uh, development sophistication. Um, but there is some enormous strides being made in terms of um, a, illustrating where new development should take place in order to combat the sort of increasing uh, migration into urban areas. Well, so thank you very much. We are now going to get Naomi to come up. So I'm going to talk about uh, two, let's see, the Green button, which is uh, right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to talk about two projects primarily, uh, and they illustrate, I think, some of the points made by the previous speakers about getting the first, getting a start, uh, but not always understanding from the beginning what the sort of needs uh, required by the market changes or changes in technology, demographics, and, and then hence the importance of flexibility. So I'm an architect and I work in a firm where planning and architecture sort of mix together. Uh, I'll skip that's an attempt at humor, but um, just, yeah, <laughs> New York, New Yorker magazine, okay? At least, at least it was tailor-made for this, for this gathering. Um, so, uh, but if we think of cities which uh, today, we imagine, were either uh, minimally planned or, of course, New York City had a, a grid as a plan. Uh, we don't always remember the sort of mud flats that occupied most of the Upper West Side, the fact that if New York City, that 
the uh, Museum of Natural History was sort of a, a, a lone lump of uh, beautiful granite uh, Richardsonian architecture. Um, and so it, we have to think about this sort of middle stages of uh, the lives of cities before they are completely f filled out. Of course, St. Petersburg is a good example of a city that grew very, very quickly. And so it didn't have that sort of uh, long, long-term adolescent stage. But still, it came from nothing. So the first project I want to talk about is one which our firm uh, got involved with in about 2002 as planners. Uh, it was uh, a tabula rasa, or is a tabula rasa condition which, uh, for, with which the city began in Korea, outside of Incheon, being itself a kind of edge city to Seoul, near the airport. So ostensibly a kind of logistics city, which was meant to be, and here's a rendering of the after the first year or so, what we proposed, uh, it was meant to be an international free economy zone. And so uh, there were sort of free trade principles, as we have encountered them in Pudong, outside of Shanghai, that would spur the growth of a completely mixed-use, diversified function city with living, working, exercise, culture, everything but agriculture and industry. And so this is what uh, the site looked like perhaps four years ago. Uh, it has a ways to go. The city looks sort of one-third finished. Uh, it's a city for 65,000 nighttime inhabitants, 300,000 daytime working inhabitants of about 1,500 acres. And you see the middle is a, a large central park. Uh, <clears throat> the idea was launched actually by the Ministry of Finance uh, at a time when the phenomenon of the new city across from the old great Chinese cities of the new parts of Beijing, Shanghai, et cetera, they felt were sucking a lot of the potential energy out of the service economy and manufacturing economy that, that spurred Korea ahead. So the process itself was kind of a tangled net of associations of a US developer who was brought in concert with a large Korean steel company, POSCO. This is a private project, a private enterprise project. It's a business proposition, not a publicly funded project. That's part of what makes it very interesting. And so the initial sketches, which established districts, transit lines, a central heart of green, um, and a zoning uh, plan, which then came after the first uh, year of work or so, uh, which also had to be in conformance with Korean national zoning, yielded a more detailed plan. And uh, this is one of the schools before the students moved in. Education was at the heart of the two major neighborhoods. But also, we as architects were allowed to use buildings to make space that would describe the quality of the space that then led to the planning. There was this sort of symbiotic relationship between planning and architecture. Uh, transit, of course, as was mentioned before, the importance of the five, ten minute walk in deciding where houses would go. Uh, a sort of a heat map trying to explain what times of day, which parts of the city would be occupied, which was very helpful in establishing where retail should go, where the more active streets should be. And um, uh, yeah, sort of social patterns that were understood in terms of uh, Korean family habits and uh, structures. Now, it is the sort of standard of Korean new town planning, and there are plenty of zones outside of Seoul that would qualify as new towns, are full of soldier buildings uh, made in a row, which did very well to accommodate people uh, when housing was desperately needed. But today, the idea was to introduce a kind of diversity of space, which then led to a kind of analytic process of understanding how housing blocks could allow for edge and center and this is an example of one such housing development, again, before the people moved in, of tower and base. Canals were a very important part of the city here. A whole district of a kilometer long uh, was made around a canal, half of which is a usable canal, half of which is just for, for sort of picturesque purposes. But it gave us a way to make a completeness out of something that was otherwise underway. It's sort of like a stage set. And there was a big environmental program, which had to do with the way water is used and recycled, black water, gray water, and drinkable water. Uh, a park in the middle was uh, made as a uh, uh, zero gardening, zero watering park. There are cisterns uh, below the park, which allow uh, water to come only from the zone, which is to be watered. 
And uh, then there is also a pneumatic trash system. One of the speakers before talked about the importance of a large project being able to redefine the under pinnings of cities. In other words, with scale, you could sort of do anything from a fresh, and this works uh, very well to bring trash to an anaerobic digester in the middle of town where energy is derived from the trash. And again, buildings, this was in the convention center that was sort of the symbol of free trade being uh, the theme of the city as a free trade zone. So the second project I want to talk about actually grew right out of this, circumstantially, because the Chinese government heard about Songdo, and then in Hunan province, um, right uh, in Changsha, right next to Changsha, came this opportunity to design a new town around a piece of land that had been a lake that Mao drained to make farmland and now needed to be made into a lake again because resiliency issues, the flooding of the Changjiang River, uh, required some relief from flooding. And so th this is an idea for a town which had eight districts and... Uh, of which this sort of radial planning made a kind of efficiency of a core of uh, commercial radiating out to little neighborhoods. Uh, and so we did various studies of the time and distance uh, economies of travel. This is an aerial photograph of where the city is, uh, let's say, a few years ago. In other words, the plan has been implemented, not with such sort of close uh, architectural uh, um, uh, focus. So. Um, the, in the beginning, you see the government had decided that, uh, first of all, uh, cities uh, back in post Deng Xiaoping area could and should grow along the coast. But at this point, then, with Hu Jintao's statement about harmonious development, uh, there was a drive to bring a larger amount of development back into the interior of the country, and in particular uh, here, this, this Hunan province location. So this Meishi Lake project had its green or has its green network of uh, both radial and patch-like zones of green. And then you see the little dotted lines that go through the water. Taxis and water travel, very important part of the idea of using the open space efficiently to move around. And so uh, then there were <coughs> uh, networks of uh, uh, movement, but of, of allowing the various functions to be mixed, basically, per each of these eight zones. So it's a mixed-use cluster kind of development as opposed to a large district development. Um, this shows a cordon of green that goes through the city. We called it a green river. Actually, there was a zone where water could come during flooding, but it becomes a kind of riverside park for the whole city looping around. And you, see, you see a section. There are bioswales that are intended to purify the waters that comes off the the tarmac roads and other, other places of the city. And then water also provides, as it does in many parts of other areas of China we worked in, in Jiangsu province, but also here in near the Changjiang uh, River uh, to allow uh, water and, and housing to sort of have a, a synergy and uh, a symbiotic relationship. Let's get past this. And then a retail district uh, in the middle where the normal principles of zoning were violated to make a higher density uh, that usually we're used to in medieval cities, but gives a kind of a, a place to be in the middle of the city. So, um, of course, water engineering, again, like the Songdo City example, and waste engineering, very important. Uh, sort of, We d did learn some lessons, I think, from the first project. And this shows you a little bit today of where that development uh, is, what it looks like from the ground. Uh, preserving a kind of picturesque nature of, of the lake in the middle. So finally, just one, one minute uh, more, I want to say something about an uh, area of practice which we are now very um, keen on, which has to do with uh, data analysis and of bringing uh, GIS into a next level uh, with some uh, sort, of, uh, sort of a think tank of uh, students who came from Colombia. And this is being applied uh, at the scale first of buildings, then of neighborhoods, larger districts, and eventually, we hope, to cities. It has to do with um, optimizing sun exposure, some of the principles that have allowed us then to apply it to zoning, and we're advising New York City uh, uh, Department of Planning uh, to help them to rezone certain parts of town. Um, but eventually, this sort of performative analysis, and you could see here, applied to a neighborhood in uh, Earl's Court, which we are uh, designing the whole of, again, not exactly a new city, but a new piece of a city to take real estate values, sunlight, air, 
uh, and a host of other factors and to start to use them in ways that serve us as a kind of visual tool to work with public officials and also to analyze for ourselves what makes a better urban fabric. And this is then finally an image of most of the center of that picture is uh, to be built as Earl's Court with the developer Capital and Counties um, and uh, design from our London office. So um, that's, those are a few examples. Thank you. We'll take a question or two before you disappear, Jamie. You're st still up there. Uh, it looks like the inspiration for the Hudson Yard staircase came from your example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Hudson Yards is, is, is our latest uh, toy in New York, yeah. You've got very close integration of architecture and planning. Has, what are the, the strengths and weaknesses of doing that, given the long-term development timelines? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, one of our fears, perhaps, and I'm not saying we've overcome this any, any more than anybody else of new city planning and practice, is the potential to make a sterile place. Uh, by planning, uh, regular dimensions, systems of construction, do we boil the serendipity out of uh, urban environments the, by, I think, designing not just buildings but clusters of buildings once one has the ability to sort of uh, reintroduce some of the granular qualities that should be the accompaniment to large-scale planning. Of course, pitfalls might be that as non-planners, really, we're sort of driving without a license and certain things we don't understand well as well as, as sort of proper planners do. But I think, you know, obviously best is if architects can work very closely together with planners simultaneously. I think that's the point. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pascaline Gabri from uh, Brussels. Hello, I'm, so I'm Pascaline Gabri. Maybe Lynn will be shorter. I'm not, I'm, I'm uh, an urban designer, no, I'm an architect, I'm a political scientist. And as Anne said, uh, I've been working with uh, New Towns for 15 years with local authorities, practitioners, designers, and also researchers. And we've collected a bit everything in our in, uh, uh, books. And the last one is called European and Asian Sustainable Towns. And that is a collective work, a little bit like this conference. I'm pleased to give you a copy. And So just as um, uh, as introduction, new towns of the 20th century have been the dreams and, and the playgrounds of a lot of uh, visionary and less visionary urban planners, decision makers, uh, leaders. And uh, they did not come uh, as ideals, but they came with pitfalls, difficulties, challenges uh, that we are linked to uh, the difficulty to build uh, something from scratch, but also difficulties in land acquisition mechanisms, uh, uh, in the, the, the fact that uh, lifestyles change, uh, in the fact that uh, um, uh, it's not only about urban planning, but it's about creating a sense of community, a good image for the place, and um, that it was difficult to attract sometimes first inhabitants and first residents to, to keep uh, and attract retail and to create a mixed-use planning. So. Uh, uh, a lot of things uh, have created more or less su successful new towns uh, in the 20th century, but we can have, uh, let's say, uh, key lessons uh, of new towns that are very interesting for urban planning in general, that these new towns were really of the 20th century conducive to innovation, um, as I'm Sandy say they are crucibles of uh, innovation and uh, urban planning. Um, that the forecast of the future is not an exact science, that they need to adapt to a lot of changes. And the first master plans, most of the time, had to be adapted to the reality and uh, the changes within the new towns. Um, and uh, finally, they were also resilient because they had to adapt to uh, a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, evolutions. Um, uh, for instance, um, the first new towns were really car-dependent cities. They increased a lot of the traffic con congestions with the creation of commuters between the, the new towns and, and the, 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 the mother towns or capital cities. And uh, that, that led to uh, additional problems to solve. Um, so I have some pictures of... Oh, this one. 
uh, of uh, new towns a little bit in different countries. Uh, the first one is uh, Nayaraipur in India, and I think it's a very interesting city. It's uh, one new town from the 21st century and not from the 20th century because it started after 2000. Uh, it's uh, created as a new capital city for the state of Chhattisgarh, and uh, the, the surface is... Uh, a really huge, 8,000 hectares. And uh, what is very interesting uh, is that it's uh, uh, built around 41, but uh, the core 27 villages, and uh, most of them are going to be preserved within the city. So it's going to be a divide between the urbanized areas and the more rural areas. But what was interesting is that they tried to really build it incremental so that uh, it would not be, let's say, a forced top down urban planning, but uh, we would be built for. Uh, the whole society of, uh, of the city. So they have a cricket stadium, they have housing areas. They are, of course, um, they need to have a, a phasing, like a lot of new towns have, because they need to, uh, financing of new towns is, is important, as uh, Rick <laughs> knows. So they need to sell the first uh, um, dwelling units to get the, the, the necessary amounts to develop the other parts of the city. Um, yeah, so, and, and we went there with 21 urban planners, economists, landscape, landscape architects, and one of their recommendations were that maybe the road size were too large, a little bit like on the model of New Delhi, and that it would uh, create maybe a um, low density uh, settlement. So, here. Uh, so, these uh, again are some. Uh, parts of uh, Nayaraipur. Uh, these are the new construction areas, and here you have uh, also um, residential housing. And uh, they also invested a lot on tribal arts, because uh, that's also one of the characteristics of their region. And uh, they wanted really to be part of, the, of this new city, not to be only a modern, copy-pasted style. Uh, now there are pictures of new towns around Shanghai, um, as you may know uh, Shanghai had a program of uh, one new city and nine satellite cities, and uh, each city has um, a different pattern. Uh, some of them are inspired by a European city, uh, which is the case uh, of Luotian, the, the Swedish style city, there is one Dutch style, and uh, Thames Town, Songtian, which is the British inspired. A new town, and Qingpu or Chutajia, which is um, uh, the Chinese-style uh, new town, uh, which I had the, the, the possibility to, to exchange with. And they, they, what they do is very interesting because they uh, they've tried to uh, really respect here also the the old heritage from the city and to integrate it with the with the new parts uh, and the new residential development. Their question was still how to integrate the industry and the industrial park in the city, into the city, uh, let's say. It's still quite of specialized um, zoning as, as it is made. And this is Lothian, the, the Swedish-inspired uh, model. So the first year I went there, uh, I was really surprised. I thought, well, it's really uh, copy-paste from uh, a Swedish style. So it's a Swedish company, Suico, that I made, has made the city center. And I was not really convinced it would create really uh, an interesting new town. But then the year after I came, the metro connection was built with Shanghai, and it started developing. And the year after, in 2013, they had even the Chinese Urbanization Forum there. And uh, as you see, it's quite developing. And what was very interesting is that I, uh, restaurants, retails just popped up in the streets and it, it, it really makes the place. So now it would be probably a good city to live in. And uh, they have also public spaces and uh, amenities for uh, leisure, for the weekends, for people from Shanghai also to come to the city. Um, then one European example, Basildon. Basildon was built in 1946. It has a population of uh, 100,000 uh, inhabitants almost. Um, and it a little bit illustrates the, the fate of uh, uh, British new towns that uh, were really ambitious from the start, uh, very visionary, but in the 1980s, they had budget cuts and they had to, uh, let's say, survive. Uh, this crisis and to invest in uh, attracting a lot of businesses and industries to uh, um, 
to be uh, performant and, and still uh, attract the uh, residents. Um, still, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting city, although you see some uh, social um, uh, housing is, uh, is a bit... Uh, uh, it need to be uh, refurbished. Uh, and this is my last li slide, <laughs> do not worry. Uh, uh, finally, a uh, new town also in Egypt, um, New Fayoum, that is uh, 100 kilometers southeast of uh, Cairo. And uh, uh, what I found interesting about New Fayoum is that uh, it's an entirely ghost city at the moment. Although it was built, uh, the master plan was very interesting. It was a mixed use development. The construction started. They even have um, spot facilities for the residents. But uh, because of also uh, the situation there, um, it was difficult from a governance uh, model to find the first residents to come to the city. And there are, of, uh, fortunately, other ex examples in Egypt that are much more successful. But I wanted to show this one because that's exactly what uh, you wouldn't like to have as a new time, is to have a ghost city, because then you increase the, the pressure on the ecosystems and, and you, you just do not have the, the benefits for the population. So, and, and there are these uh, ghost cities, not only in Egypt, but we have even uh, around Madrid in Europe, we have uh, also a uh, project that stopped because of the crisis. So this is something that maybe we could uh, think about. Thank you. So is this a ghost city now because, uh, put it back please. <laughs> is this a ghost city because uh, it was too far away or because it was stopped in the middle? I'm. Yeah, it's because uh, I guess I'm, the question of uh, the, the, the state in Egypt is that it was a top-down project. And there, it was maybe not as accepted as the existing city, Fayum, which was located uh, uh, nearby. Um, and also because you don't want to be the first resident, I guess. Right. You know, you need first families to move there, and then maybe other ones will follow. Um, and, and since you've been based in Almira in the Netherlands, uh, I, you uh, said earlier that its trajectory uh, it, is much more popular and, and highly thought of than it was a few years ago. What has caused that change? Um, you mean the, in Almera that it was uh, more yeah. popular? Um, yes, I think, yeah, this, uh, the thing is because Almer is really nearby the capital city of Amsterdam, and that's really about the, the prices of, uh, of her housing in, uh, in Amsterdam are really high, and it's a bit lower in, uh, in Almer. So that explains that a lot of people have moved there uh, and still work in uh, Amsterdam. So it creates uh, questions of commuters, but they had foreseen the problem in, in Almer. They had created a really great uh, train, uh, railway transport connection between uh, the capital and, and the new town. So it, it's now the fifth largest city in the Netherlands, so it's kind of successful in, in, in that sense. So, <clears throat> last but certainly not least is uh, Alex Garvin, who's come here uh, uh, we're from teaching at Yale for 50 years and uh, having many uh, positions uh, in uh, uh, New York City government planning and his own firm where he has spread the gospel uh, around the country and internationally. He has just published... Uh, is this like your eighth book? No, but... Uh, <laughs> so we have flyers. Uh, it, uh, actually, if you take this flyer, you can get it at a great discount. Uh, for It's only $32, and I've actually been reading it with great interest. It's entitled, What Makes a Great City? And it's absolutely fascinating as to uh, the examples uh, throughout the world uh, uh, of cities that uh, he has visited over the years many times and uh, how they have matured and what makes them so great. Alex, uh, uh, you're going to give a commentary on what you've heard and probably your first lecture ever without slides. <laughs> That's true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Can we have the lights up, please? I was struck uh, by one of the things that uh, Stephen uh, Kellenberg began with, and that is how do you evaluate whether one of these new towns is successful or not? And in the beginning, one of the things that he raised was uh, measurements that you could actually take. Uh, the carbon footprint, uh, for example, would be one. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of these kinds of 
uh, measurements that you can make. Uh, what is uh, the rate of illness? Uh, you can compare one town with another. I'm more interested in qualitative questions uh, than I am in measuring the specifics uh, of the exact acreage of open space. For example, um, who lives there? Is uh, this a place uh, with an equitable distribution uh, of the new town to different income groups? Or uh, let me ask another thing. Uh, what about beauty? We have been looking at designs from architects. Uh, are they beautiful or not? Is this a place that you'd like to be? Is it comfortable? Would you feel comfortable being there? Uh, and the designers have to be able to predict that. Again, Stephen Kellenberg uh, gave us four criteria to use. And I want to pick one of them, the public realm, mainly because that's the main subject of my book, uh, What Makes a Great City. He never explained what, how do you judge the public realm? And from looking at the images that each of these designers presented, it's very difficult to tell what the quality of that public realm is like when you get into it. It's especially true of the last set of photographs. Uh, I was looking at, the, uh, at Egypt and thinking, would I want to be there? And then you tell us that nobody lives there. Uh, so I propound in what makes a great city six characteristics of a great public realm. The first, it has to be open to anybody. Is it really open to anybody if you can only get there by automobile? Uh, the second is, it has to have something for everybody. That means children, it means the elderly, it means disabled, it means activities of one sort or another. It's not about the acreage, it's about what you can do when you get there, and is it a place that you can do these things uh, in concert with everybody else. The third thing is, will it continue to attract a market? It's very interesting. You showed us Basildon and said it began in 1946, and in 1980 they were having trouble getting people there, what the British called Newtown Blues. Well. Uh, that means that uh, it was not able to continue to attract that market. Uh, I would argue that a great public realm continues to do that. Uh, and it is adjusted constantly. Uh, the boulevards of Paris would be a fine example. Think of what's there for everybody and how it changes all the time. Uh, my favorite example of a square like this is the Plaza Mayor in Salamanca, Spain. You can come there at any time of the day or night, and there are things for people to do there, uh, whether it's having a glass of wine uh, or uh, children playing uh, on the, uh, in the open space or people walking through on their way somewhere else. The fourth thing is sustaining a habitable environment, something that each of the speakers began to talk about, uh, usually in how much open space there was. Uh, a habitable environment has to do with the temperature, the amount of sunlight and shade, and what you can do in India uh, is very different from what you need to do in rainy Britain. Uh, and how you deal with this becomes very important. Uh, you showed, Jamie, St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg has a very visible structure, and the public realm has to provide a structure. Uh, everything focuses on the Admiralty Tower uh, in St. Petersburg. That's a very different structure, say, from Vienna, which has a Ringstrasse. Uh, and that, those are public realms, streets. And finally, um, can you nurture a civil society there? Can people get along together in that place? Some of the images we saw don't look very, like that happens easily. So I ask myself, first, 
How do you measure the success of these towns? And the second thing that comes to mind was a picture that Jamie von Klemperer showed at the very beginning. It was of my hometown, New York, and it showed an eight, a, a, a 19th century view of a street with houses on it that in the, later in the 20th century has apartment houses on it. And that is one thing that goes on in uh, towns and cities all the time. They do not remain the same. They change. And one of the things that struck me about all the presentations, uh, except to some degree the last one, are these places that will be able to change easily. What are we doing to examine a new town that will look differently a uh, hundred years from now, where the needs will be different? Uh, many of you were not here, but the people in the front row were when we were talking about uh, Columbia, Maryland, a planned new town that was begun in the early 1960s. And uh, I asked a question during the, that time about the uh, Retail commercial spaces there, and they're not the same. The stores are different. In fact, some of them have been torn down. New apartments are being built right now where there was once a commercial center because they need more customers to survive. So I would say that when we try to evaluate planned communities, uh, we need to think about this in terms of time and in terms of human qualities not just geometry, acreage, and site plans. Thank you. If I can ask our panelists to please come up front. And now uh, we will take uh, questions from the floor. And uh, uh, if you have a question, if you would speak into a mic so uh, we can get you uh, on recording. Although I think perhaps some of the panelists might want to respond to Alex to start with, because he was critiquing the whole idea of new towns, and you might want to. Does anyone want to? Um, uh, I want to correct you. I was not critiquing the idea of new towns at all. I was saying that when we are evaluating them, we ought to have standards that uh, we can apply that will allow us to judge whether they are successful or not. Well, I, I agree with absolutely everything you said, uh, and, but I don't think it's one or the other. I think there's a, there are uh, metrics that can be used to uh, create and enhance the functionality of the town, but the, uh, the secret sauce of you know, great placemaking is, is, is essential for its longevity and, 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 and really creating value for its residents. So I thought you were right on. No, I see a lot of students, so uh, you've never been shy before. <laughs> I, but just also, if I can add a comment, I think it also depends on the needs of the new towns. Why do you build it? What is the project behind? I, I mean, is it because you have uh, urbanization and demographic pressure? Is it because you have customers? It can be also like you have people wanting to live there. Um, or is it just uh, you know, a technocratic project, top down, I would say? So uh, Professor Pizer knows his students well, uh, never shy. Um, as a, I don't know, one of the mice that ended up living in a new town, I lived in the Woodlands, Texas, uh, through high school and whatnot, and lived in both the new and the old section of the Woodlands. Uh, how much do the new towns have to be maybe parasitic in a way, in their infancy, to draw in new people? And how do a lot of new planners think about that parasitic nature that that new town starting out needs to be? Because they draw these beautiful plans, um, but they can't support those beautiful plans right off the bat. And just to clarify, you mean parasitic on its region? Um, well, like Amsterdam, like with, with the Muir in Amsterdam, um, or some of the other ones that kind of were close to Shanghai or Cairo. Um, 
how dependent are they on their larger host to draw in new people? Uh, I don't know. Or on jobs. But yes. If I could say that slightly differently, uh, do we find any successful examples of the Greenfields new the Greenfield new towns as envisioned by Ebenezer Howard? That's a very good question. I'm, yeah, I think they're really the, the towns you mentioned. They're really dependent on the uh, mother city or capital city uh, in the way that for jobs, first of all, even if they try to be uh, in, uh, they, they have the jobs uh, housing uh, ratio equal to one. Um, and uh, secondly, um, uh, because of activities and, and uh, you know, uh, regional special special planning, um, and about the greenfield uh, uh, cities of uh, Howard, I think for me it's a, it's a very good question. And especially if you look at Eastern Europe, uh, there were a lot of these greenfield towns, and they've been successful for a while. But uh, now they are also shrinking cities, uh, losing inhabitants, and that's that's also questioning a little bit the, the model. And I think the other aspect here is that um, there's clearly, I think, some advantages in if one can select a new town boundary which already contains some existing development. And I cited Milton Keynes as a particular example. Um, then you have an existing core of residents and hopefully a range of community services that can um, be expanded and built on to satisfy new residents. Just, I, I would bring up a, an example of, uh, built by the sponsor of this program, of, by Von Kerr, in, uh, just outside of Hangzhou. And just to point out that I think we all know that the demographic growth, the, the huge boom of uh, this period, recent period of Chinese growth allows uh, Hangzhou is a, a big city, of course, and uh, shouldn't overrun its West Lake, which is the great heritage site of China. And so Von Kerr's town of um, David Chipperfield designed residences and some chapels and landscape uh, seems not to be a parasite because the host is so robust. In other words, there's so much being built in Hangzhou already, then it's more of a release valve than it is of a parasite. And I think it's, it's a very beautiful uh, town, this, uh, this sort of leafy uh, suburb of, of Hangzhou. I think it's important to make a distinction between new towns planned by governments that have a public policy of settlement. If you, you look at the Soviet Union in the first half of the 20th century, they were opening new towns. Uh, across Russia because they had not just to absorb an agricultural population, but they wanted to settle certain areas. If you go back to France uh, in the 14th century, you will see the Bastide towns were to settle the border of Spain to protect France from invasion. Uh, Israel uh, has been doing settlements on the West Bank. And there are many reasons that governments may choose to go into green fields where you cannot be uh, a uh, parasite, as you put it. In market economies, on the other hand, you have no choice because the customers have to come from somewhere. And if you are not paying attention to the customer base and what it is looking for, you're going to have a failure on your hands. Uh, you will not be able to fill up the town. So, uh Adam? Uh, thanks for these wonderful presentations. So I had a question about social mix, and that social mix both in terms of uh, life cycle, so different age groups, um, as well as affordability and income mix. Um, so I know a lot of new towns were built you know, in the UK or in the US, even Levitt towns, to deal with baby boom and big demographic pressures related to child rearing. So schools obviously would play a big part there, recreational facilities. Do you have any concrete examples of new towns adapting as ages change, or new towns catering to, say, I mean, I know um, um, Irvine was more catering to an older population with, with less children, so how that demographic uh, component was addressed. And then in terms of income mix, even though many of the US examples were private developments, how investments in affordable housing and subsidies were provided to ensure income mix going forward. Well. 
thank you. Uh, I think uh, I would give the Scandinavian new towns model uh, for for this question, uh, both in Finland and in uh, in um, Sweden. They've built these uh, uh, socially mixed new towns. Uh, for instance, Hesselby Vellingby in Sweden, where they try to adapt all the buildings for the elderly people, so they had to change the, the building structures to add lifts and elevators, obviously. Um, also, in these Finnish new towns, they, they are a mix between, let's say, the, the public uh, new towns and the, the private new towns in the way that they have also a board of directors. And they're really uh, community-oriented, uh, although they get a lot of uh, public funding uh, through the taxes, <coughs> etc. Uh, and um, uh, they, they also try to have a, a good social mix uh, among the, diff the, the population. That, that's one of the best examples, although the, the, the planners are not really, uh, let's say, satisfied with the results. They would like to have more, even, social mix. Um, what we found in the more successful new towns, in, including Irvine, is that there was a, uh, actually a very intentional uh, effort to create as much housing product segmentation as possible, ranging from at any one time during sort of the, I would say, you know, during strong market periods, as many as 15 to 20 different housing types all under construction at the same time, from affordable housing to workforce housing to condominiums to townhomes to small lot detached to medium lot detached to large to luxury. Uh, and, so, and, and then overlaying that, a very strong educational infrastructure with some of the best schools in the country, as well as a university. And by the way, the, the question about the, uh, the parasite thing, um, you know, one, one approach to that is what we call inducers. And there's, there's if, if, if the early aid stages of a community are not very strategically designed to try and bring in jobs and for instance, in Irvine, there was a university, University of California, Irvine was brought in, a thousand acres of land was given to the state for a dollar in order to create a, a, in a, in a, in a two, in a major business park was initiated next to a regional airport. And so that there has to be a lot of creativity to sort of create inducers for job creation. Otherwise, it resorts to a bedroom community. And there are thousands and hundreds of, of bedroom communities around because they couldn't figure out how to create that, that early, uh, in inducement of jobs and employment and institution to create to create the balance. Could I just add, um, when I wrote a book about Irvine, Columbia and the Woodlands, it was part because they were good examples of this, but for them, um, having some social mix actually, as um, Steve said, really helped their sales. They could t they had to capture a large part of the housing. Um, market in the region, and so having a variety of types would let them do that. Um, also, having workforce housing allows you to attract better employers uh, to your industrial land, so because it's part of a larger um, sort of uh, package that you're, um, uh, you're providing, and so the sort of the scale that um, Newtowns work at allows them to do that. And when I looked at actual like certified affordable housing, each of them had a lot more than you would imagine, although less than we might hope. One of Irvine's problems was it was beautiful. And so I'm actually pretty good at picking affordable housing, but I had not known that some of them were actual affordable units. And in other cases, um, there's this large tension between private developers and in the US public purposes. So I forget whether it was Columbia or the Woodlands maxed out on their kind of Section 8 housing and tax credits that anyone would give them in the region because they were very successful with them at first. And then finally, you know, outside the US, it's a much more complicated picture. Um, and there's lots more sort of uh, potential for mixing because government has a stronger role in the market. And the US is the difficult case. And not everywhere is perfect, but some of the best new towns actually do this much better than you imagine because um, when you go and visit them, the affordable housing is often somewhat invisible. We make a big mistake by only looking at what was built initially in these towns and at the disposition of government subsidies. Over time, these communities age. And as they go get older, some of the housing becomes less attractive to the consumer and the price comes down. Furthermore, they've been amortized because over time, the mortgages are being paid off and the property owner can afford to rent at a lower price 
in response to the market. So I think we have to look at these new towns not just during the first decade or so, but also over 50 or 60 years. Uh, furthermore, people get older. Uh, they retire. All of a sudden, the income they have has dropped. Uh, they're still in the place that they lived in before. So uh, it takes time in order to uh, develop the kind of economic diversity that you might wish to have in a new town. Uh, Rachel? I was um, struck by what James was saying about the danger of creating sterile environments. Um, and I, I think my question is, is that something that planners can incentivize or encourage, or is that something that just has to happen naturally over time in a new town? Opinions? Well, I'll answer if nobody else will. Um, we, we, I can only speak for, I guess, our approach, and that is <clears throat> we, um, one of our theories is finding a balance between sort of nature and the man-made environment. And if you look at uh, even projects that are brand new, the amount, they, they, there's, there's two or three sort of immutables that they have. First of all, they always have people gathering places. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a school, a shopping center, an office park, there are outdoor spaces for people to gather that are human scale and are appointed with comfortable furniture and movable furniture. And uh, things that we've learned over time, people really look for to be, have, be comfortable congregating small groups, mid groups, uh, large groups. The other thing, we, pr we plant more trees than you can imagine. And we don't plant little trees. We plant really big trees so that there's a, a, a maturity to the landscape. And, the, and, the, and part of it comes from this, this real belief that people are have a, are drawn to nature and drawn to the natural environment and that if we can create a balance between the natural environment and the urban and the built environment from the very beginning that it will create kind of a more comfortable framework for 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 people to be in and the last thing we try and really take our streets and our our spaces and create human scale by again you know we, we pull the, the the sidewalks away from the streets we put in planter strips you know, we, we put stoops on the buildings, you know, so that they really feel like there's a, a humanity, you know, to, you know, to the environment. And we do, and, and we're lucky because a lot of what we do, we build ourselves. So we can have control over that and do it in a manner that we, you know, is trying to achieve those, those humanistic goals. Yeah, I, I would add, <clears throat> in response to your question, the, uh, because we served as architects as well as planners on this project, we were sort of victims of our own rules. And uh, so you, you, you write rules of zoning, and new towns have such zoning codes, so do existing cities. And sometimes those uh, make for some very good kinds of urban space or logical arrangement of buildings, uh, but they can also be very limiting, I think we all know. So most zoning, uh, codes change over time. And so we see in New York, the 1916 zoning, the 1961 zoning, and, uh, and many changes in between. In a new city, if it's built so quickly, I think the issue is, is there sort of one way of doing things that then doesn't allow for the varieties that we love in cities? So one thing we did in this, uh, in New Songdo City, which is the part that actually hasn't been built yet, but was to prescribe one zone, it was a large kind of a triangular series of blocks, where there'd be no rules at all. So it was sort of like, uh, it was meant to be a market zone where all kinds of crowded buildings could create little passageways of interest. Sorry, like, well, but, but, it, but it was in, in what was it? But it was a sort of a market area. So this would be, for those of you who know Seoul, it would be like in Sadon, which is, uh, you know, that's a beautiful area. So <clears throat> not the high rise. The big developers need the rules. But anyway, I think that is one thing one could try to do is just have kind of off limit zones. We're almost out of time. I'd like to ask each of the panelists to reflect back on their uh, long careers and pick uh, one mistake made, lesson learned uh, that uh, uh, 
they think uh, uh, informs uh, future new town development. I'll start because I'm probably the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> I think the lesson I've learned is that uh, the beginning of a new town project, you say, wow, how exciting. Big new area, green fields. I can plan the hell out of this. Over time, I've learned that uh, things change dramatically after the first three or four years. So I think what I've learned is to try and make sure that initial decisions, A, allow for flexible futures and accept the fact that there will be significant change. And so make sure your first step at least is the good one, even if others change it somewhat. So for me, it's been a, a, a sort of lesson in, in, in trying to reduce egos and accept fact. Yeah, I think for, for me, the lesson a shorter span, over a shorter span of time is, uh, although you sort of have to begin planning with traffic in mind, movement, it's like the, you know, the, whatever is the skeleton or the circulatory system of the body, but uh, the, the lesson I, I've learned is don't let traffic engineers shape your city more than they should, which happened to us in Korea where we wanted four lane roads and they were 10 lane roads because the national system made them be. But we all know some of the best cities that we love to occupy are cities where traffic actually doesn't work in central zones and therefore people have to walk. So if you were to replan Siena with traffic engineers, it wouldn't be Siena. <laughs> I would mention two real quick. One was the, uh, and you know, the the communities that have done the done the best, cyclical timing has been critical to their success. And sometimes it's 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 just luck. Sometimes it's it's foresight and and, and discipline. But if you're starting a major new project, starting at the beginning of an up cycle of an economic cycle can make all the difference versus the, the alternative, which can make all the difference in the other, other direction. The, and, and, and part of that, and that relates a little bit to this idea of a uh, urban design structure that can stand the test of economic cycles, because no matter what you think, your, whatever your plan looks like, it's not what's going to get built. Something else is going to get built, but if you have integrity to the structure of the plan, that will sustain and, and, and carry the project through. Uh, um, and, and, and then the, the other thing really has to do with, and it has a little bit to do with this public space uh, issue. And it's very tempting to design wonderful public space, but if the land uses around it that activate it and make it possible aren't sort of consistent with the market dynamics and the realities of the marketplace, it will be, it'll be a dismal failure. So the hardest thing we do, I think, is, is the juxtaposition and the interaction of true market dynamics and realities with you know, the, creating these wonderful public spaces that we all think about and, and, and want to have great pictures of out, in, out of our projects. If Steve agreed with everything I said, I agreed with everything he said tonight. <laughs> I, I want to bring up something quite different. I've never been involved in making a new town. I've been involved in existing cities. And the mistake I made was to advertise a great success. Uh, I was, for the first 15 months, in charge of rebuilding the World Trade Center, um, the vice president of the LMDC, and I was determined to get back Greenwich Street. And today, Greenwich Street does go through the site again. But I talked about it. The next thing that happened was that the governor's office and all the people that had to do with the politics of the state of New York needed to cut off my legs, and they proceeded to do it. So I would urge you, worry about the politics and don't advertise your successes. And I'd like to make one observation that I've learned uh, having studied uh, new towns for an entire lifetime and, and uh, being interested in the finances and frankly why they so often go bankrupt, uh, at least to the first owner. And the lesson there is that you really uh, can't have any debt at all on the land. If you are carrying uh, uh, and having to uh, pay interest carry on the land, it's almost impossible to, uh, uh, to uh, 
see it through to the point where you reach positive cash flow. Anne, would you like the last word? Oh, Pascaline, do you have anything to add? Oh, I don't have a, a lot of things to add. I think we've covered a, a lot of points. I, car dependencies, uh, no residence engagement, not enough. Um, green spaces that is uh, used by, uh, by residents, uh, integration of environment, re reduction of uh, the pressure on ecosystems, more regenerative cities, a little bit like uh, Steve uh, develops in his uh, presentations with a uh, green infrastructure. So there are a lot of things, and as you say, the governance uh, and, and, and the political projects are also important uh, to take into account. But what has been done in the past, in the 20th century in Newtown, has been done, so most important is probably uh, for the future that I do not forget the, the old Newtowns neither, so that they keep going as well. Well, I'd actually just like to thank you all for a very stimulating discussion. And um, just I'd like to ask the audience to join me in uh, thanking them again. Thank you.